Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Sign out, sign back in. I had to do what this time. Don't worry, everybody. He'll be back. Okay. He'll be back. Yep. I hear you, Mark. Don't right, worry. Cool. We're here. All right. All good. good. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Word Balloon, the Comic Book Conversation Show. John Suntress here. I don't know. Mark and I are faded lately. Mark Wade and I, when we get together, some sort of internet nonsense happens and bumps us, but we're going to make it through this hour. Mark, great to see you. Welcome we back. We will limp along and make it work. Absolutely, sir. Good good to see you. <laughs> Likewise, man. Jeez. Um, COVID, uh, LA, how you handling everything? You doing all right? Okay. Yeah. I mean, most of my energy is spent being mad at people who walk around swearing they don't want to get their kids vaccinated. But other than that, all good. Yeah. Are you boosted? Are you are you all uh, uh, next week? Up? Oh, hey, that's great, man. That's yeah, excellent. you have to. I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but the second shot hit me hard, and so got to, you know, I don't want to have that on Christmas Eve or whatever. I want to, you know, right. in that the right day. But in the meantime, staying safe, you know, keeping the protocols. When I went to see Spidey, I bought seats to the left and right of me just to get people out of my way. You know, spoiler free review of Spider Man. Fantastic, like, everything awesome. you could want and more lived to up hear. to every expectation there you go well you're one you know you're one of our guys man you're a good uh, barometer of Thanks. quality movie or not so it's great to hear yeah. and uh quality comics lately man hey i really love what humanoids has been putting out there and one of the things we're going to talk about is uh the uh, history of science fiction yeah uh that uh came out this is amazing now uh a f originally a french uh, production i'm assuming yeah it was actually done by printed by our Paris office, uh, I guess earlier the, earlier this year, maybe late last year, galleys came across my desk. And even though I can't read a word of French, I looked at this and I saw this is something. And then Alex Donahue, who was our COO and, you know, bilingual read it, said terrific. And so it was given to us, uh, translated my, you know, everything was spectacular. Uh, Xavier Dolo and Gibraltar Morissette fan did an amazing job of of taking the history of science fiction and really covering it from the ancient Greeks to like last week and in, in such depth. And so it is such a dense book, but I don't think in any way it's slow or boring or, or hard to read. It doesn't read like homework. It's just, no. it is just so comprehensive. I, it, the, the, the index alone is like, six point type, you know, and it's just like, you know, you and I can't even read it at, the, at our age. So, but exactly. exactly. Man. <laughs> but I, I just, I'm, uh, you know, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, I think that's, this is going to be the thing I'm proudest of so far at this company. That's awesome, man. You know, really gorgeous art. I mean, I, I just yeah. want to show a couple yeah. obvious panels early on that gives you a taste of, of modern uh, sci-fi in a lot of ways, but really the other great thing is, and there's our, there's two of our narrators right there. Robbie the robot and uh, who's that on the left? Well, I would say I would say uh, for copyright purposes, I would say probably Robert uh, a a robot is kind of what I would say. Fair but enough. yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, and I don't and you know, kind of looks like the butler 
from the I think it's from uh, I think I think Simac. I think it was from I think it was from Simac City. I think is is the the touch point there. Okay, fair enough. This is great. It's it's really a documentary of sorts. Yeah. Uh, and and I love that. And also, it's a great comparison to other documentary comics like what Ryan Dunleavy and uh, and Fred Van Lente do. Yeah. Where this is more of a it's it's a bit tongue in, tongue in cheek with some virtual conversations that have never happened, but you know, you guys present them that way. But like you say, it goes from literally ancient times to modern day. Yeah. And I, and I feel a, a bit of a kinship to this because about 10 years ago, I got to participate in a show for the discovery channel that really Scott narrated called profits of science fiction. Yeah. And I was one of the talking heads and we, yeah. we had a lot of what's covered here in, uh, in the volume, you know, uh, an episode about Jules Verne, an episode about, um, Asimov and uh, and Lucas and uh, you know and uh, and in fact the series started with the suggestion that Mary Shelley yeah was the first sci-fi writer with Frankenstein I'll die on that hill I'll personally die on that hill um, yeah. it's the the stuff we're able to cover it's you know it's as you've seen it, maybe a third of it is more illustrated text than traditional comics just because there's so much information to get in there uh, but the comic stuff it, it takes you know, part it, ta it takes place largely as imagined conversations between, you know, Isaac Asimov and Robert Silverberg and, you know, the, you know, more contemporary writers and so forth, uh, Michael Moorcock or whatever. And yeah, they're not factual. Conver these sure. conversations never happen, but they read very much like, I mean, they're, they're very grounded in what those guys actually sounded like. Um, they are full of information, you know, everybody's kind of telling their own story about how they broke in and how, how they, you know, how they experienced the world of science fiction. And it's, it's a cool device because not only does it use comics well and, and uh, lets us do what we do well in comics, but seeing science fiction from the point of view of the people who created it, it was also a really inspired choice on the writer's part. That's awesome, man. And um, now you say it came from the Paris office. Do you get a chance to talk to, and maybe they don't speak English, but do you get a chance to talk to the creatives directly? And yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, email more than anything else. But sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they're, you know, I'm, I'm glad to report they're very happy with the, the product over here. Uh, even though we had to do some substantial editorial work in it, not because of any flaw they had, but as you've seen, so many of these pages have sidebars, right? If you like this, then you might enjoy this, 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 and this. And all of that stuff was French, right? All of that stuff was either, you know, a lot of it was stuff that is, you know, universal or, or global. But a lot of the stuff was, here's a French novel. Here's a French short story. Here's a French movie. And so with the help of our editors, we went and had to do a deep dive and really just take those sidebars and, and blow them up and, and rebuild them so that, so that I'm not sending you to something that you can't read. But the, the, I think the outcome was, was really good and also allowed us to cover even more things than, than we cover in the actual text. Very cool, man. Nerdette wants to know when the release date is for this. Uh, already out. Already there out. 30, $39.99 at your local bookstore, a local comic store, Amazon, however you want to get it. There you go, man. Maybe there's time to get it under the tree. If yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's, I think there, if you go Amazon, I think there's time to get it on the tree. 208 pages. Again, an all day sucker. You're gonna, this is not a, a, a book you're going to sit down and read in one evening. You're going to, you know, it's going to take you a while to get through, but it never feels like homework. Is, is humanoid affected at all by uh, the, the, you know, the, the port situation? And yeah. The yeah. I mean, every, every, everybody is, and we're, you know, it's, it's less the port situation for us than the printing situation that, you know, everybody's scrambling to get yep. printers. And so, you know, a lot of times the guys that we normally go to, you know, our go-tos are calling us and saying, I have, you know, we've got a backlog now because other companies have come to us because other, other printers are having troubles. And so that's, that's the real issue is we're really having to play fast and loose with who we go in terms of printing. And also, you know, yes, we can print your book like we always do, but you won't have until April this time as opposed to January last year. Sure. So these are the decisions we're making on the fly. And again, Alex Donahue is our, like I said, our COO and our, our man in the field there. And he's keeping, I, I, he's keeping all those plates juggling. So we are managing to get everything out though. I mean, nothing's missed ship yet. And uh, we've, we've been very lucky. 
Excellent, man. Here, Dean Hasfield name checking us, and yeah, I agree with him. He one of the top five writers in comic books. I agree. Always a pleasure to indulge anything he does. I agree with that as well. Um, I here uh, here's a question that uh, came from Kings, uh, yeah. Kingsport Cal. Uh, he loved your run on Daredevil. What do you think about them and introducing the characters into film? Oh, if that happens someday, you know that would be awesome. Um, I. I I think that, you know, I watched the show, obviously, yeah. and I know Stephen tonight, and I think it was a really good show. It's not, it's it's far more Frank Miller's Daredevil than my interpretation of it, but sure, you know, that's that's cool. I mean, I and I understand why because it is really hard to get out from under the shadow of Frank. I think we were Carl Kiesel did it for about an hour and a half in the late '90s when he was allowed to, and then he was gone. And then we were the, you know, we're the other people, the only people who've come around to, you know, to try to go out from under Frank's shadow and try to, you know, chart our own path. But yeah. regardless of what tone they take, you know, if that happens someday, then that would be awesome. All right, man. Okay. People are already asking about the other thing I wanted to talk to you about. Hey, everybody, uh, uh, really jump ball. Any questions? Mark is always great about that. And uh, I, I, we may as well transition into a Lucas's question here. Uh, could you speak a bit about the Doom Patrol being in World Finest and what that means to you after your career's connections with the team? Oh, that's funny. This guy is somebody who remembers that I edited Doom Patrol. I edited you know, Grant on Doom Patrol. It was it was a trip because when you edit Grant, all you really do is take out all the extra U's and all the words. Um <laughs> Because he's brilliant and he's, you know, and that's what British people do. And it's, you know, with Grant, with some, you know, with a lot of writers, you're working hand in hand, you're helping co-plot or you're, you know, fussing with dialogue or whatever. And with Grant, it's just a bullet training. You just grab on hoping for the best. Uh, so that was, that was a blast. I've always loved the Doom Patrol. I've always loved all the incarnations of the team. It's the basic concept for those who don't know. Uh, the basic concept is uh, you've got originally three people, uh, Robot Man, right? Cliff Steele, a race car driver. You got Larry Trainer, who was a jet pilot. You got Rita Farr, who was an actress. And all of them had horrible fates befall upon them. And they were transformed. And this guy named Niles Calder comes along and, and does something. It helps give them a normal life. And what's often overlooked in that origin is that it wasn't just that these people, and I, this is why I think is really interesting. It wasn't just that these three people had these horrible accidents happen to them. It's that they happened to them at the exact moment that they were about to achieve greatness. Like Cliff wasn't just, it wasn't just a race car accident. He was going to win the Indy 500. You know, Larry was about to be the first guy to break the sound barrier. Rita was making the movie that was going to put her on the map. And these things happen to them. So it doubled the tragedy. Yeah. And that undercurrent of tragedy plays really well against the team of Superman and Batman because they own, you know, they have their own tragedies, but they've dealt with it in a much different way than the Doom Patrol has. And they've been, you know, physically less affected by it and so forth. And so it's, you know, putting them in the book was part of it was because I love the Doom Patrol. Part of it is also because as you careful as careful uh readers will pay attention to and know when i take on a book one of my favorite things to do right away is start putting in villains and guest stars that you've never seen in that book before you know let's have daredevil fight claw let's have captain america fight you know wh whoever um and with superman and batman i've never seen Superman and Batman and the original Doom Patrol together in a story. So let's let's do it. I don't blame you, man. That's awesome. Uh, of course, last week is when the news broke yeah. that you were doing World's Finest with Dan Reba. And is this uh, Dan a Dan Moore. cover? Yeah. I'm sorry. Or Dan, Dan Moore, Moore actually. Me, not sorry, Dan Reba, Dan the Moore. animation guy. Dan Moore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, man. Sorry, Dan Moore. No, I no. apologize. Uh, great cover right there from Dan Mora. Yeah. And um, so yeah, is. Is the plan uh, a, a like a long story, or is it is it episodic? I mean, how how would you describe what you're going to do with the book? It's it first the first uh, remit was 
don't feel like you have to set it in the exact here and now, because then you're trying to race against the continuity of, of what's happening to Batman and what's happening to Superman concurrently all the time. And, you know, Superman's in space right now. And yeah. so, so it was just go, you know, make it in the near past, just go back a little bit. And uh, that way we get to use the classic toys. We get to use, you know, the Batcave and Alfred and Lois and Jimmy and Lois doesn't know the secret and Dick Grayson is Robin. And, and that's the era it's set in, but the approach is still very contemporary. I mean, it's, you know, my editor, you know, Paul Kaminsky is my first request of him was like, for the love of God, you know, do not let me become a nostalgia act on this book. Do not, I don't want to be that guy. And I, I, this is not trying, I'm not trying to recreate the silver age. I'm not trying to recreate anything in the past. I want to tell contemporary stories, sure. but you know, I, I like using the characters in their classic form. So that's, that's what we were mandated to do. So the first, yeah, first uh, story is a five issue part, a five part epic with the Doom Patrol and a few other guest stars. And then well, one offs, it's, you know, some longer stories, Part of it too is that the other sort of take on the book is it's it's a lot about Superman and Batman, but it's also a chance to look at the rest of the DC universe through the lens of Superman and Batman. Like sure. with, with the Doom Patrol, you get to look at the weird, strange part of the DC universe through the lens of Superman and Batman that you don't normally see through that lens. You know, understood. No, and um, again, it'll be great to see. And the Doom Patrol is a prime example. But I'm hoping that as much as you don't want it to be a nostalgia show, the pantheon of DC heroes, you know better than I do. Yeah. How many great, uh, maybe smaller heroes that don't get the spotlight that often? This is a great chance to to in, reintroduce them and and again put a put a modern spin on them and through the lens of Batman and Superman. So yeah, exactly. I would imagine hopefully that uh, yeah, man. I mean, I don't even want to name check because. Uh, I, I have faith in your uh, in your taste and your direction, man. I actually I, I I put you know we put the weaponers of Horde in for a couple of pages in the first issue, and <laughs> my the assistant editor Dave wrote back and said, "Oh my God, I can finally put you know I, I never thought I'd be able to fill my bingo card with the weaponers of Horde, but thank you." And so I made him a bingo card. So I made him a, a bingo card with here's here's twenty five squares and here are the twenty five people that I want in this book, you know. Outstanding, we, you know, hilarious. I'll let That's... you know when we do like the Bizarro Man Bat team up or whatever we do. You know, it's it's it's, but there's so many of these characters, and not just ancient characters that only you and I remember. I mean, you know, modern characters as well, or more, or, you know, more modern ish. But it's just it's just fun to take these characters and look at them through the lens of Superman and Batman because it gives me a chance to show you something about the character that you may not know or something that I've long wanted to say with a character that I haven't had a chance to say. And I've got a lot to say about a lot of it. As you know, I'm the only guy in the world who can talk to you about metamorpho for an hour. So this is my chance. I, you know, yeah, you know, and I hope, and, and again, without spoiling and stuff that maybe some of these other characters, as much as Batman and Superman are kind of the ideal and they're at the top of the pyramid and stuff, that maybe some of these people obviously have a different way of doing things and may not be as uh, deferential to uh, the big two. Right. I, exactly. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it really is the dream assignment. It's really is the first Superman comic I ever read was a world's finest comic when I was a kid. And that was my introduction. And I love them as a team. I love them as friends. I get the take. I certainly understand the take of, you know, grudging friends or you know a real tension there and that's great and i get that but you know what you can throw a stick and and find somebody doing that same exact take somewhere else so i'd rather do a different take and rather just drill down on the fact that these guys are deep they're best friends and it doesn't mean they agree with their with all the time it doesn't mean they're always on the same page and they do operate differently and batman is still batman i'm not making him you know, like a, a Superman light. I'm not making him Adam West. He's still Batman, but I, you know, these guys are best friends and let's, okay. let's run with that. Yeah. That's all, you know, honestly, and I, and I, I said this to Jeff Johns back when I think it was infinite crisis was going on and, uh, and uh, earth to uh, Batman uh, tells uh, or is no, it's uh, earth to Superman tells earth one Batman. Hey, I know you don't know me, 
but you and I are really good friends. Yeah. And it really was this awesome, like you could feel like Batman, like kind of like this guy really does know me as much as yeah. I don't trust him. And that's no, that's also. And also I remember being in college and I think you might've been writing for amazing heroes at this point. I don't know where you were in your DC career, yeah. but that last issue of regular world's finest yeah. that was right before the man of steel and yep. the new direction for Batman and stuff. And they kind of like come apart. And it was yeah. this really like odd kind of sad story. And I know what you mean because I'm like, oh man, come on, man. These guys are friends. What are you guys yeah. doing to this? Yeah. So, you know, it's great to see them back again as friends. I mean, that's, I agree with you, man. They know, they know each other. They respect yeah. the differences within each other. And if anything, it makes their friendship stronger because man, at least I got somebody else who thinks differently. And, exactly. you know, so yeah. You well, the other thing, that. and the other thing that makes that I'm doing that I love that makes the, I stumbled across this, but it realized that made it makes it different than any of the other recent Batman Superman series uh, is that I want to make Dick Grayson as Robin the third player. He's there in every story. I, I like him around not only because it makes it different than the other takes that have been happening in the past, but it also it gives me, that's my chance for comic relief, right? Batman's not going to quip. Superman has a sense of humor, but he's not a jokester. But Robin, you know, is the one who can just, we can see through his eyes what it's like to be Batman's assistant. We can see through his eyes what it's like to be this kid who gets to hang out with Superman. And that's a blast. And it's not like, like it's not like 12 year old Dick. It's more like, you know, 16, 17 year old Dick Grayson. So he's not all agog, but still, He's witty. He's funny, and I get, so at least I have somebody to deliver the jokes. That's awesome, man. I no, I'm I'm very excited for this. Uh, Dave wants to know, looking at your background, uh, that you have some original comic art on the wall behind you. What is your favorite piece of original comic art? I will tell you. I will. Let, you know what? Let's see here. I'll, I'll zoom in on you. Yeah, oh. please hold. I, your All right. is important. To oh, us. I please like hold. this. All right. Say this is good. This is interactive. Mark's. Uh, Mark's. Uh, Willing to get up and, oh, look at what he's bringing. Stand by, everybody. Zoom in. Boom. All right. Aha. Now, I've told this story before. Shall I tell it again? Please. So, my all-time favorite comic book is Action Comics 500. Came out in 1980. Big oversized issue, The Life Story of Superman. And I wanted to be in comics. I wasn't sure I wanted to be a writer. I didn't know quite how to get into the characters' heads and stuff, but I, you know, I just want to be in comics. And I read the story. It's written by Marty Pasco. It's drawn by Kurt Swan. Yeah. And there's a point in it. Superman's telling his own life story to his friends. And he talks about crypto. He talks about when he was a boy, this finding this dog that also came from Krypton that landed, crash landed on Earth. And the way he talks about crypto on this page, that it is just so meaningful for him as a kid who has been all alone and no one else in the world is like him to have someone who understands how we feel somebody who knows the the feel of the wind as you fly through the air or the sound that bullets make when they bounce off living flesh somebody else to share that with meant the world to him and boy boy that got to me that got to me when i read that it was my first real look at this is how you do it, man. You get in the character's heads. You really think about what their lives are like and how they feel and how they move through the world, not just when they're punching villains, but when they're living day to day. And, you know, when you've got these powers and these abilities, what does the world look like to you? Sure. And I love that comic. And then, you know, a few years ago on eBay, purely by chance, that page, that crypto page showed up wow. and I was on that like black on a bowling ball. <laughs> and that, you know, I've got a lot of original art here, but that's the one that means the most to me. That's the one that hangs, you know, in a prominent place so that when I forget what I'm doing and lose my way and get a little stuck, I just look at that page and go, you know, that's, that's how it's done, man. You, and you know that uh, I, I, I was very fortunate to become friends with Marty at, at yeah. the last few years of his life. And man, I, that's so great to hear, Mark, because truly, Marty never felt like that he belonged up there with Elliot, Magan, and, and Kurt, and uh, uh, shame on me, Carrie Bates. Kid Carrie Bates, right, yeah. Yeah, you know, the, his contemporaries that were writing Superman. And I'm like, you're goddamn Marty Pasco. Don't you ever Pasco. forget that. Right. Oh, you my know? God. So, I, I, wish, I wish he knew. I wish he had known how influential he was 
to a big chunk of his audience that grew up to, to write comics or be in comics. Cause it's just, like I said, I, I learned a lot from Elliot Magan. I learned a lot from, you know, Denny O'Neill. I learned a lot from Steve Gerber, just reading their work. But Marty is the one who taught me the lesson that I think helps make me the writer I am in comics or helps define what I do, which is you get in the characters' heads and you, you live their life. That's awesome, man. No, I'm with you. Uh, Dave also wanted to know, would you ever consider writing the Legion of Superheroes again? I'm going to take a fourth bite of the apple. I don't, I don't, I, I was, it was a risky taking a third bite of the apple. I don't, I'm not in any rush to, because I, I see what Brian Bendis has done to reinvent the team and I yeah. understand it and I salute his intentions, but that takes it further away from the Legion that I know. And I don't know that I could get back into that same passion for those characters. And it's not a slight on, on what he's done. It's a great book. It's a great take, but I don't, you know, that's not my legion. And therefore I don't have that emotional attachment to it. Again, I cannot stress enough. That is not, I'm not saying that's not my legion. It's wrong. No, I'm saying it's just not my legion. And I just don't have the attachment to it. It's awesome, but I just don't have the attachment to it. I respect that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Ed goes, I'm sure I already know the answer, but how does it feel to finally be able to write both Superman and Batman on an ongoing basis? Ed, you know the answer to that. Um, it's great. I mean, I've, you know, Superman has been, as, as everybody knows, who's ever heard me talk for two minutes, you know, knows that's been the, the dream job. But being able to do Batman as well is pretty cool because I've been thinking about Superman since I was, you know, 10. But... Batman, I haven't really been thinking about it as much. I, I, so really having to dig in there and, and you know, really sort of excavate what Batman means to me is a lot of the fun because I have I've not really done that with Batman. I've never written Batman except in a team book. I wrote a one-off, that Batman in Barcelona book that came out a few years ago. is the only solo yeah. Batman story I've ever written. So that's not a character, even though he was my entrance because of, of uh you know adam west it's still not a character i've really spent a lot of time with that's interesting because of course your justice league run as well yeah you know i mean the uh, batman is the focal point in a yeah, lot hinges of on batman yeah. yeah but i've yeah. never written just here's a batman story yeah how'd you like uh the uh, uh animated adaptation of uh uh wasn't it was wasn't that yours the the contingency plan that uh, bruce has for everybody oh yeah tower of babel that? yeah tower of babel exactly yeah i i i was fine I, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I've never finished watching it. Interesting. Um, okay. It was, it was a, it was a sore point. It was, it was, uh, DC is always very good about, you know, if they're using your material in a movie or TV or something, they'll, you know, some, not a whole lot of money, but they'll, they'll, you know, give you a little taste. And that movie came out during a short period, a window in which they weren't doing that anymore. Oh. And so it, yeah. It stung a little, you know, sure. it, it's, sure. that's, that's my story. And, you know, I, you billing it as this is the adaptation of Tower of Babylon. They're not, I, but that's a different regime. That is a different, you know, that's a time ago, I, you know, Dwayne McDuffie's amazing. If anybody's going to adapt that, I would want Dwayne to do it. And, but I've, I've never really watched it because of, you know, since I'm you happy. asked, you know, no, me, no, I will be I, honest I about anything. So. How how has this uh, really uh, the current regime and everything? I mean, you're, oh, it sounds like you're getting to do what you want to with World's Finest. Yeah, stuff. yeah, totally. And also let me add, let me just reiterate too. And comes in terms of taking care of creators for media stuff. They're they're mu they're back on that train, and they have been for a while, which is great. Um, but as far as letting me do what I want to do in World's Finest, it's just it's been a it's been a kid in the candy store thing. I mean, really, Beautiful. I just like. Do whatever, whatever you want to do, Mark. Just go to town. So, excellent awesome. here. Very, very cool. Uh, let's see here. I want to. Uh, I ran. I, I uh, got out of uh, uh, question mode. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I got out of uh, out of line and everything. So yeah, here. Let's see. Uh, oh, Ed also asked additionally, how does your approach to writing a team up series different from writing a solo series for each of these characters? The the difference is I have to think more about villains. I. I mean, obviously you think about villains whenever you're writing these characters, but 
I, I really have to think about villains for world's finest because it's not always easy to figure out somebody who can be a threat to both Superman and Batman. Um, and I'm trying not to, when I first did my first pass on, here's the first year I want to do, I was kind of heavy on Superman villains and that's great, but uh, you know, it kind of short trip to Batman. So that that's the big difference to me is just what kind of stuff do they go up against that, where each of the characters, whether it's Superman and Batman or any team up book, where each of the characters has something to do. Uh, absolutely. And also uh, finding it would be interesting digging deeper into Batman's uh, rogues to yeah. find something that really is a threat to uh, Superman. I loved back during, you know, uh, the uh, the beginning of the 2000s when uh, Luther became such an important yeah. Batman yeah. Villain during the cataclysm and no man's land and all that stuff. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, that's intriguing. Or even in Marvel when uh, the goblin was suddenly, uh, you know, yeah. a, a, a great Iron Man villain. Right. And it's like, or, oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Or people forget Kingpin was not a daredevil villain. Kingpin was Absolutely. a Spider-Man villain. The, the potential for Batman's rogues, I think is strongest in the idea that for all of Superman's gifts and for all of the things he can accomplish, he and I, I think this is the very first line of the first issue. He doesn't know how to think like a criminal, and that's the that's one of the fundamental differences of how these two men approach their job. Superman, for all his, it doesn't know how to think like a serial killer. It doesn't know how to think like, you know, a, a psychopath. And Batman does, and so that's I think that's your hook for a a Batman villain in World's Finest is you know, leaning on that difference between the two men. Absolutely. You know, as as I've told you a million times, my favorite scene of uh, Batman and Superman uh, is your your diner scene in Kingdom Come at the end at Planet Krypton. And, uh, you know, hey, how's Luther doing? Oh, I caught him trying to hack into the uh, Batcave computer the other day. Uh, he yeah. says hello. And yeah. Superman, yeah. Really? Really? Yeah. Like, no. No. <laughs> yeah. Because Superman sees the good in everybody. He's still yeah. hopeful that the worst. I'm, I'm sure he believes, you know, if I just sat down with the Joker. I bet I could get it through to him. I, I really do. I don't because if, if he didn't think that way, he wouldn't be Superman. Yeah, yeah. totally. So, Nerdette, uh, you're very sweet. I see that you shared our live video. Uh, that's very nice. Thank you very Thank much you. for doing that. We appreciate that. Uh, David Santos, I love your Wonder Woman story and the 80th anniversary. It's the best take on Wonder Woman. Brings the just bringing. Uh, it's the best to take on what Wonder Woman brings to the Justice League dynamic. She motivates others to challenge themselves and grow. Yeah. That was fun. I got the call to do a 10 pager for that book, eight page or 10 pager, I forget. The Wonder Woman 80th anniversary when they said we can get Jose Garcia Lopez on it. I, again, I just lit up like a Christmas tree because I that's one of the very few all stars I've never had a chance to work with. That's great, man. And yeah. boy, did he deliver. But, but the, the again, this comes back to what I'm saying get in the characters' heads. What, what does Wonder Woman bring to the team that no one else brings? which is not an easy question to answer when you're dealing with the justice league and you're dealing with Superman and these other super, you know, she's not stronger than anybody. She's not tougher than anybody, but what she is, is she has the, she has the wisdom of Athena. That's her gift. Like nobody in the team has that level of wisdom. So she's the one you want leading the fee, you know, leading the battlefield. She's the one you want you know, calling the shots this is the one that even Superman looks to for advice, which is really kind of the heart of our story. That's awesome. You know, uh, David also asked, are there big ideas you'd want to explore in a Justice League title if DC offered you that book? I assume that in this Batman Superman with one with the guest stars, it almost offers the same kind of dynamic. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it does. Justice League is a tough nut to crack, though. I mean, again, I've once I told, you know, Heaven's Ladder with Brian Hitch, which is sort of my ultimate justice league story i don't know i don't know what i do after that um and you know it also you know the team you know is sometimes it's full of characters that i have an att attachment to sometimes it's full of characters that i don't have an attachment to and so that also plays into it I, I i'm sure i've got a justice league story in me somewhere you've never needed uh like what is currently being afforded to a lot of dc creators with the black label imprint you've never needed that kind of edginess to tell an edgy story. I mean, you've always been able to do it within the mainstream. Are there any R rated stories for a lack of better description that you would want to explore in a black label book? 
I, if I did, they wouldn't, they would be R rated based on the, what they're talking about, what the, the, the issues, the, the yeah. philosophical issues the you know, that's that, that sort of adult look at this stuff. I don't know that I have anything else in me along those lines. I just, I, I don't, I salute and respect the people who have done some really great black label books with yeah. some of these other, with some of the standard characters. I can't find that in me because in my mind, they're just not built for that. Uh huh. And I just, I don't, I don't, I don't think I've got like an R-rated Batman story in me. I don't think I've got an R-rated Superman story in me. I think that the challenge to me and the fun of it is trying to tell those stories and trying to tell that level of, you know, trying to, to be that edgy and that thought provoking and do it within the sandbox that I'm used to being in. Understood. Absolutely. Are you able, and this is something that I've asked older creators, yeah. but are, are you still able to read any DC and Marvel stuff for pleasure of current stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's okay. You know, it's, it's not, and it's not even so much how long I've been reading comics, but it's the moment you get into comics, you know, especially if you come in as an editor, like I did, and suddenly you're getting all the comics for free. Well then, you know, and now you've seen behind the curtain, now you've seen the great and powerful Oz and you know how comics work. And so that kind of takes away the fun. It's like, you know, knowing all the magician secrets, but yeah, I mean, there's stuff I still read. There's, I mean, it's, you know, at, at Marvel, I, I, I like what Dan's doing on Fantastic Four. I like the, some of the stuff they're doing on Spider-Man. Uh, I, I love what Tom King does, especially at, at DC. Uh, he keeps scooping the characters that I would want. People ask me, well, what are the new characters you want to write? Yes, I do. And Tom always gets to them first. So then my answer was Adam Strange for a long time. And then my answer was Human Target for a long time. Oh, so, man. So I've got to, I really need to coordinate more with Tom. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, well, but there's, yeah, there's stuff I read. All right. Five, five or 10 years from now, there's still time to address those things in the future. It's all I'm, right, man. I'm still young enough. Yeah, so, exactly. They'll still be there and everything. Yeah, yeah. That's great. And I'm so glad you mentioned in both cases, obviously it is Tom with Adam Strange and human target. I love this human target thing. And I yeah. love the way Smallwood is drawing it. It is so yeah. like, you know, if Robert McGinnis were to ever do comics or something like that. And I, I just love the his color palette that he's using. Yeah. Oh, I mean, and yeah. again, you know, this, the, I guess those things are kind of nostalgic sort of, but it, I don't know. I think they're timeless. You know, yeah. I, I, that's how I look at it. A little bit of Saul Bass with the opening credits. I mean, really solid stuff. Yeah. <laughs> You're killing me, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Radium Theater Productions, the variant covers of Superman slapping Batman is ridiculously cool. <laughs> the Darcy. DC's variant game is magnificent at the moment, sending me broke. Yeah, how did that happen, man? Do you know? I, I'm just done. I was watching from the outside happen. I think what Paul Kaminsky said, let's do it. Let's use that meme and do Superman slapping Batman and Batman slapping Superman. It, it's a great idea. And, and Chips at RSD executed. Um, that's Those are great variants. The other variant that I think is terrific is that whoever illegal managed to jump through the hoops got us Jerry Seinfeld for the cover. So we've got, you know, comedians and cars getting you know in batmobiles getting you know coffee with superheroes and that's <laughs> yes. a life if you haven't seen that it's online everywhere it's fun i love that absolutely man i saw that in the article uh i forget if it was cbr or whomever when the announcement was made they had all the different variant covers they're fantastic all right a couple of our buddies uh ed cato recently joining the league of word balloon listeners thank you for your patronage patronage ed uh he says dean has bills right about you uh our good friend uh art baltazar uh yagums which means you're a good man sir oh that's nice to hear okay so so absolutely i was talking already last night in fact uh let's see here what else uh are you having other superman projects besides black label one and this uh world's finest one not not yet i do have a yeah i mean i do have a getting back to what you were saying about black label stories and stuff. I do have with Brian Hitch, that one black label Superman book, but again, it's not, you know, we're not seeing nudity. We're not seeing, you know, extra violence or, or, you know, curse words. It's more, and if you're looking at the issue of why Superman does and doesn't kill, you know, then, and you're looking at a real hard adult, serious look, grown up, look at that. What does that look like? So that's the kind of, that's a big part of that. Um, I mean, uh, but it's, you know, the door is open to me. It really is just, you know, as you know, I have a day job. Uh, 
as a publisher of humanoids and it's a job I love and it's a job that takes a lot of energy, but you know, I, I think there's plenty of room. I've got, it's not like I'm hurting for any ideas for Superman. That's great to hear, man. Absolutely. David, interesting question. One thing I've always wanted to know, if you're working at DC, how do they give you access to their catalog of comics? Is it only through a virtual platform? Is there a physical archive you can visit? They do have a physical archive. I don't know with the COVID logistics what that's been since nobody's been in there for two years at this point. Um, I don't know. I do know that they you know, will provide you with you know, DC Infinite subscriptions and all their digital online stuff you've got and what you don't an editor can find somewhere and get and get pdf sent to you or if you're like me and you just have everything they've ever published you come to me that's that's what you do and i will tell you where to find this stuff so yeah uh, I, yeah i i can speak from experience on that i'm sure you remember but uh i was at Terrificon in connecticut back in august and i knew i was going to have a pop panel with um uh, Maria, who who played uh, Hawk Girl, yeah, and George George Newbern, who played Superman on the Justice League thing, and I'm like, there's got to be a Hawk Girl Superman story. And at first, I looked at the animated series, and there weren't enough scenes for them to recreate. So of course, I emailed my friend Mark Wade, and I'm like, uh, can you help me out? And like, literally within an hour, you're like, uh, DC Comics presents, and I forget the year, but yeah. uh, it was a Jim Starlin story that yeah. he wrote it and stuff. Man, I just made a few forgive me changes and stuff i don't even know if i if i didn't send it to you to give you a pass i apologize i know I, we did that with the kingdom come stuff yeah. when we did the table read for that which was fantastic but um man it was so much fun and it, it's it's on the word balloon feed everybody to uh to listen to and watch yeah uh them them do this jim starlin story and again i had to go to mark to uh to get it but it's the it thing was, i can only name 38 states but i know this stuff cold <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. Mark has a great question. As a publisher, editor, peer, and uh, uh, during COVID, I've heard many uh, positive things about Mark mentoring writers personally and via web conferences. Where, where, what can Mark share about his teaching philosophy? Good question, Mark. That's very kind. I, I love teaching. I love, not just because I feel there's an obligation to, you know, I've learned so much and I've been mentored by mentored so much as I've just been able to work with so many talented people who taught me so much uh, that I feel an obligation to, here's what I know, pass that along. There's, there's institutional knowledge and there's craft knowledge. Um, and also the, the thing about teaching is that, and you know this too, is it, it forces you to look at the things that you do, the tools that are already in your toolbox, forces you to look at them through a different perspective and look at them and go, oh, well, you know, I'm not sure that I would recommend this anymore. This, don't, you know, this particular technique seems to have been out of phase or this, you know, people don't do it quite this way anymore. Um, so that's great. It, and it forces me to articulate the things that I do that I just do naturally, the things that I just do, you know, by instinct, it forces me to articulate them and why I do them. And it makes me have to look at them uh, through different eyes. Uh, for the last year, you know, I did the, once a month, I did this talent talk lecture so forth yeah. and every month and unfortunately that's gone by the boards uh they are we were a great startup company they couldn't quite make it work uh so i'm looking for another venue to do online teaching because i love doing those courses uh, but the one you know the, the other thing that came out of that and that's something we have not talked about yet is that the uh july of 2000 or 20 or 2022 will bring you know how to create comics by mark wade uh, the book by the Simon and Schuster book. Uh, Simon and Schuster through Marvel contacted me a couple, three years ago. I mean, now at this point and said, well, you know, you, you're one of the few people who has done absolutely everything from, you know, writing and publishing and editing to lettering and drawing and coloring and putting the staples in the books and all that stuff. So what do you know? And working with some and so my better writer friend, or some of my better artist friends, some of my better lettering friends, letter colored friends, and so forth, getting mostly getting them to vet what I was putting down and make sure I was being accurate and contemporary. Sure. That book comes out in uh, July, right after July 4th, I think, of this coming year. And that's that is soup to nuts, man. That is awesome, man. You know, I have an idea for a comic all the way to 
all right, it's lettered and colored, and this is how you do that. It's if you if you follow this book, I mean, it's not it's not it's not advanced course, you know, it's it's 101 stuff, but if you need to know how to do comics, and it's not, it, it's how to do comics to Marvel or how to produce comics to Marvel way or whatever it's called, because it's a Marvel sponsored book. But in reality, 98% of it applies to just storytelling in general and comics in general. So it's, don't be, don't be forced away if you think that, oh, I'm an indie comics kind of guy. I don't need to know this. Well, you know, I think there's probably something in there for you. That's excellent, man. Man, it's going to be great to compare that to Denny O'Neill's book, to Brian Bendis's book, yeah. and and have yours. And it really, I mean, uh, you know, and uh, hell, even Eisner, obviously, and his yeah. various guides to making comics and stuff. So that's great. Well, you know, obviously, in seven months, we're going to probably have to talk again. I'm happy to. And it's, you know, obviously, it's not as in-depth as those gentlemen's books, because this is a omnibus. This is, you know, all the crafts that you need. And so I'm not able to go into, you know, I could write a whole book on how to write comics, obviously. This is not that book. But this is a book on how to do, you know, how to color, how to pencil, how to letter, you know. Very cool, man. Um, I like this question by David Skelton. What is your Krypton? Is it the world of Krypton, the Burns Clone Wars take, uh, Krypton Chronicles? And uh, should Krypton, should Superman know about Krypton? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good question. And yes, he should, because the, the take on Superman that, you know, we hear people complain about the character and they say things like, ah, no thing can hurt him. I don't know what to do uh, with that character. And we've had that. That's a separate discussion. But there's also, you know, through that lens, there's also tragedy associated with that character that you don't think about as much because it is not as much of a part of his daily mindset as is Bruce Wayne's. But he lost, you know, his Mon Pa Ken, he lost his, in, in my world, you know, in the way I think of it, he lost Mon Pa Ken because it's an important step in becoming a man. Absolutely. Uh, but the, he also lost his entire planet. And I want him to know that. I think it's important for him to know about Krypton. It also opens up the door to being able to do stuff with like Kandor, the, the, one, city, the one city that escaped destruction and is his tie to his home. But, but even then, you know, it, he's he knows of Krypton and he knows of Kandor. He's been to Kandor, but it's not like, oh, great, I'm home now because he was a toddler when he left Krypton. This is uh, as alien a world to him as it is to you and me. So it's I like having those toys. So um, and in my, my vision of Krypton, I, you know, I mean, my personal vision obviously is informed by what I read growing up, but. I've made my peace with a fortress of solitude that doesn't have a big yellow door. Uh, I, I get it. I, I made my peace with that. Uh, and Krypton itself, look, as long as, as long as the basics of, of it are the same, which is that it's a civilization that had grown to its complete pinnacle. And then this horrible tragedy happened that was not caused by anyone. It was not started by anyone. No one blew Krypton up. It, it's just because that's just when you do that, when you try to write that story, then you've taken something else unique away from the character, and then it becomes anybody can write a revenge story. Then it becomes then becomes Superman's part of Superman's you know mission on this earth is driven by revenge, and that's baloney. I don't I don't buy that for a second. Um, the other thing about having you know krypton be a part or 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 superman's take on krypton i don't know you know what i actually i've i'm so deep in this i've lost the thread and i've already forgotten what i was going to say next but okay let's let's move on i'm sure there are other questions all right fair enough man no i appreciated all that well, here's the other thing about krypton i was going to say the other thing go for it. i was going to say yeah, there's, go there's, for there's it. it's difference right. between the difference between earth and krypton is a very tiny difference but it's very important on krypton Yes, morals and ethics drive the society. Every system, and they're basically like Earthlings. Um, uh, uh, their morals and ethics compare very favorably to ours. But they're also a very scientific nation or a wor world, whatever. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and in my mind, if you look at you know, here's ethics and morals, and here's science, and here they're very their relative importance in society. I think on Earth. 
It's a little, you know, a little more morals and ethics, just a little bit of them. And then on Krypton, I think the balance shifts a little bit. I think science is a little more important than, than basic morals and ethics. Yeah. And, and that is an interesting dynamic to me. And that is, that is gives something for Superman to think about. It gives some way to inform, you know, Superman's upbringing. I think that, you know, Ellie Magnet did this great book in the seventies, a Superman novel, you know, the last son of Krypton where he postulates that. And it, it sounds silly sometimes the way you I phrase it, it, I don't think I would do exactly this, but I like the instinct behind it is that in Elliot's story, yes, the Kents found him, but mostly by accident because he was intended for Albert Einstein to find. Like jor wanted Einstein to find this kid because that's, you're a Kryptonian, that's who you look to um, as, as a scientist. So I'm not, I'm not sure that plays, but I like the instinct. I love that too. And I, I remember reading that book back in the late seventies when it came out and was tickled with the idea that for a brief time, uh, Albert Einstein could uh, read and, and write uh, Kryptonese. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and then, and that very thought, and no, you're right, man. I mean, that's why the science council is running the planet essentially. Exactly. As opposed to, you know, you know, how, how are you feeling today? Uh, leadership. Right. Exactly. So no, I'm totally with you, man. No, that's awesome. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, John V wants to know, Hey, when are we getting the oral history of cross gen comics? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> it's there's either, there's either a really long involved deep version or there's the very brief version that is like, Oh God, please. That's the, you know, <laughs> it made a lot of talented people more talented. It did a lot for a lot of artists. I think that that is there's a lot of people who came out of cross gen with a good experience. I I agree with you. I just the the end of it all was just so ugly and people not getting paid and people who moved out across country to be there right. suddenly right. you know and, and while while the guy who owns the place is still living in a in a mansion. Um that was ugly. If you'll remember, you know, back in that time there were freelancers who just hadn't been paid and they reached out to a bunch of, they reached out to me and I, you know, I made the same deal for about a half a dozen of them. I said, look, if you'll file the paperwork, cause I think it's wrong that you're not getting paid. I think when, if no matter what you pay your freelancers, no matter what you pay those people. And if you will file the paperwork and you do the heavy duty lifting, you know, and all the work and all I have to do is cut a check. I'll help fund any sort of small claims case. And we took a couple, we took, uh, you know, a couple of those to court and a couple of those freelancers, uh, you know, got their, the money that was due them. And I'm very happy about that. It's just a shame because there was such, there was so much good happening there, but there was also the dark side of it was there was a real cult mentality to it too. Uh, because again, you're trying to isolate from everybody else and, and deliberately isolated from the comics community as a whole and deliberately sort of, you know, bread as a, you know, we're all a fan. We're all, it's, it's us against the world, which is very cult 101. Um, so I, if you had a great experience at cross gen, I am very happy for you. That's cool that you were able to help these people, you know, some of them get the money they deserve. Definitely. Just, and yeah, you know, the creative end was so uh, refreshing from cross gen yeah. that to hear the business side and how sour things were and how bad things got, yeah. it was disappointing. So I, you know, again, I know John was just, well, I'm sure he is interested, I and mean, I'm sure maybe someday there will be a real. Maybe somebody look. I, you know, I'm not in a position to to write one or put one together. But if somebody does, boy, they sure know how to call who to call. Understood, man. Definitely. Um, oh, you know, David points out, and he just bought uh, Last uh, Son of Krypton. Elliot has re-released uh, both Last Son of Krypton and Miracle Monday under his own imprint in the last couple of years. So if, I mean, you know, I've got the original paperbacks yeah. and, and they are probably on my shelf, but uh, if you want to get new versions of them and they, that directly, obviously Elliot will make money from them and stuff. Yeah. Uh, you can look those up on Amazon and then find those books. And, and absolutely. I can't recommend uh, last son of Krypton or miracle Monday more. And I know you, of course, are a massive same here. Miracle I mean, Monday miracle fan Monday's, well. You know, one of my favorite Superman stories of all time, if not my I favorite Superman story. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, is your Black Label story, come? Uh, did it come from your tribute to Action Comics 1000, which never came to fruition? Oh, I kind of see what you're saying. I I guess what 
that question means is I wasn't asked to do anything for Action Comics 1000, but that's, you know, or during that, you know, 80th anniversary celebration or whatever, but that was during a regime change at DC. And so I didn't take it personally. So it doesn't really kind of, I, this, there's no connection. Okay. Um, oh, this is interesting. Are you working with uh, Taika Waititi? Uh, are you excited yes. for the Incal movie? Yeah, we're, we're buddies. No, we're not buddies. I mean, I, we will be <laughs> if I have my way. But yeah, we've announced uh, you know a few weeks ago at Humanoids that uh, Taika Waititi will be writing and directing and heading up uh, an Incal film for the, you know, the very near future. And That's amazing. It's, you know, it is those who don't know, I mean, Incal is, you know, not well known in this country, but overseas, it is one of the best selling science fiction graphic novels of all time, you know, by Alejandro Dordorowski and Mobius. Uh, and it is, it's, it's terrific spellbinding story that has been so influential to comics, artists and film uh, creators in the last, you know, 30, 40 years. And it's way overdue. So I, uh, I did get to meet with Taika briefly. It did not go well. Um, it went okay. I got a couple of minutes with him. So when I have a couple of minutes, minutes with somebody that big, I like to think about what I can ask them or talk to them about that you don't normally, right? Because ah, I love your work. Well, that's a dead end conversation. But I knew somebody who had told me that reservation dogs show on Hulu that he had remote directed that for, you know, because of COVID. Like, how do you remote wow. direct something? Yeah. It's really wow. interesting. So I thought, that's my entry. That's the conversation. And so I asked him, so what was that like? And he goes, oh, man, I, that was something. And he's like, he's really not happy about the situation. So I pivot as quickly as I could. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, by the way, I mean, as somebody who's written Thor, I really love, you know, what you did with the Thor franchise. Oh, man, that was really a tough one. Oh, my God. Oh, Holy my poor God. guy, man. Yeah. I, you know, and before I can recover, it's like, Mr. Wittini, we need you in, in, you know, room two. And so I, it's a bad start. You know, oh. But, but I got my, I got my chance at the end. He's doing his interview, you know, the background stuff for, you know, for Incal or whatever. Okay. And he starts talking about film in general and he starts and he talks about how, you know, he, he once heard, he doesn't remember the director. It was, you know, a good movie is like, you know, four scenes that are good scenes and like one, you know, none that are bad scenes or whatever, but I wasn't sure. And, and then he kind of went off on that and I was able to catch him at the end of it. He's like, he's walking through the room as I'm sitting there and I went, John Ford. I was like, what? I said, John Ford, it was John Ford who said a good movie is three good scenes and no bad scenes. And then we started talking for a second. That so I got a chance to pull out of the nosedive. That, you know, I got a chance to that. So that was that was a nice day. There you go. That a boy. Yeah. That's great to hear. All right, a couple a couple more before we wrap. Uh, yeah. uh Liberty Brigade released this week. How did you enjoy editing the Golden Age characters? So is that that um Kickstarter uh, Roger Stern? Uh, no, this is actually a Michael Finn who is uh, a longtime fan, uh, richer than Croesus, and uh, has been collecting artwork from comics uh, comics artists for years and years, and has you know has done a favor. He's also a lawyer, so he's done a lot of pro bono work for a lot of comic book people, and he is very well loved and very well respected by the community. And he decided some time ago, you know, I want to do my own comic. I want to do like a one off. He dredged up all of these public domain golden age comic book characters and just managed to get them all in there uh, in this big hundred with this thing that was going to be 64 pages, then 96 pages, then it ended up being 132 pages or whatever. It's a, uh, drawn by some, you know, Barry Kitson and, uh, you know, one friends and just, a, you know, done by a bunch of different artists who were, uh, you know, who really good people who owed Michael a favor. And he pulled me in to edit this thing with him and help him polish up the script and so forth. And it was a blast. I mean, because it's just unadulterated fun. There's there's nothing about this that speaks to uh, the world of 2021. It's just it's a fun superhero romp with these golden age characters during World War II and a lot of amazing artwork. And that's Kickstarter. And it's you know, we'll, I'm sure it'll be available at some point beyond 
you know, because Kickstarter fulfilled or whatever, but I'm sure it'll be available to other people through some venue at some point. It was fun. That's awesome, man. No, I, I had no idea that you uh, edited this. That's great. Yeah. That's cool. What were some of the, the Golden Age uh, public domain uh, people? A lot of Fiction House and... Uh, yeah, a lot of know. Fiction House, a lot of uh, better standard Nidor characters, a bunch of, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think. I mean, there were just so many. You've got U.S. Jones, but you also have Yankee Doodle Jones, and you've got, you know, Airmail and Stampy, his sidekick, and it's ah. just... It there, it's Stampy. a it's a riot, you know. It, it's <laughs> he found every he combed because he's a lawyer. He knew where to look. He found every public domain comic book character I think ever, and they are they are all in there. And buddy, some of them are just shoved in there, but they are you know we made it work. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, let's wrap up with Radiant's uh, yeah. question. What was your favorite Legion story as a fan? And that you've written, and he also wants to know who your favorite Legionnaire was to write. Okay, he's he's our. I, I know this one. Um, favorite Legion story, the very first Mordru story, Adventure Comics three sixty nine three seventy. It's it's Jim Shooter who was like eighteen at the time, but in Kurt Swan doing Legion at their pinnacle, creative pinnacle. This is nineteen sixty eight, and it's an amazing story because it does something that. I, I've since learned to do, and I love doing this. There's a part, it's a two-part story. And part one starts with, oh my God, Mordru, the greatest, most evil magician of all time has escaped. And it's just Superboy and Mon-El and Shadowlass and, and Duo Dams, let's, the only Legionnaires around. And they've got to make a plan and there is no time. So they retreat to the 20th century, to Smallville, so they can get a moment. And just breathe. They're not running away, but they just need a moment, just a moment to gather. And they're there. And then something else happens there. And there's a whole story that happens during that time. And you're involved and you're interested and it's good character stuff. And then they, you know, save the day in Smallville in 20th century with one page left to go. And all of a sudden you turn the page and there's more Drew. Because you've forgotten about him by this time. The story has been so good. So that the structure of that is brilliant. I love that, you know, you set up something in the very beginning and then we make you forget about it until the climax. And then, oh God, I forgot about the bigger thing. So that's my favorite Legion story. Uh, the favorite one I've written, um, I don't know. I, 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 maybe end of an era, maybe the, the, the I, probably the, the end of the Silver Age Legion, the, the, okay. the, Pre, the, you know, pre-crisis legion. That was, you know, it's a group effort between me and Tom McCraw and Kurt Busick and a few others, but I got to write the last, like the last legion story of that, of that group. That was probably my favorite. Um, and as far as legionnaires to write, Brainiac 5, come on. Brainiac 5 is so much, you know, you know, I like writing the sarcastic geniuses. Those are my favorite characters to write. <laughs> But Brainy is so great because he is such a snob and he is such a dick sometimes but he also has a real human side to him and just that you know that that sarcastic dripping sarcastic looking at the rest of us like we are toads which we are to him intellectually that guy i i could write brain act five all day long that's awesome man no and you know that is my one wrinkle of uh what ended in the pre-crisis continuity is of course his relationship with supergirl yeah and uh that's that's a shame and also what do you think of uh the modern take on Supergirl that, I mean, it really wasn't explored, I think, until recent years that unlike uh, Kal-El being an infant leaving yeah. Krypton, she was a teenager. She did live in a Krypton right. Kryptonian society, not only on the planet, but also when Argo City was right. broken I mean, off. That, was, that was there baked in from 1959, but they never really explored it very much. Right. But but what they've done with it now and and the genius wrinkle. And I think it's Jeff Loeb, right? Who who said, okay, he she was supposed to be, she was sent here to be Superman's, you know, babysitter. Yeah, yeah. And then she'd get caught in a in a time warp and she doesn't get spit out until 30 years later, and he's all grown up. That's that's real. I, you know, I love the original origins of these characters, but with if you make a change like this that's so clever, I can't deny it. It's a really it's a really smart spin. Very cool, man. Uh, I, I, do you have time for one more or you got to go? One more, yeah, let's do one more. All right. David wants to know, because he asked earlier, do you have a good Julie Schwartz story? I, I have hundreds of good Julie Schwartz stories. Um, 
but oh my god but my again it's like asking my favorite child at this point there's so many julie <laughs> schwartz stories but just just sitting with him just listening i listening to him talk about the history of comics through his eyes and the guy who was there from 1944 on through you know the 90s and and all he had seen and done and the anecdotes i would get from him just little stuff like you know going up to him and going you know in the first phantom stranger story in 1952 the word phantom looks a lot like it's been re-lettered in the house by somebody what happened there and he said oh yeah it was called the mysterious stranger that was the title of the book it went to it almost went to press that way but we changed it the last second of the phantom stranger little tiny things like that that only i and a small handful of people care about sure but little tiny bits like that little <laughs> little tiny things he was just he was kind to me he because he came from fandom he understood you know that that fans wanted to be pros and so he's the guy who gave me my break he gave me my first my first comic story and uh you know i owe that part of that career to, to julie uh but just i wish his i wish his biography were better i wish that man of two worlds was his autobiography but yeah yeah but a because julie was so reticent understandably as a gentleman to shy away from any anecdotes that might actually reflect poorly on anybody else whether no matter whether they were dead for 50 years or whatever um he there's a lot of stuff that's not covered there and then structurally the thing reads like a 200 page larry king column i mean it's just there's no there's no structure to this thing also there's no there's no through line there's no narrative it's just it's my two anecdote, cents. anecdote. Nine, then yes. in 1953 then in 1967 then in 1922 then this it's just it's so all over the map but he i hear is, you man yeah, yeah he you know i i owe so much to julie and and it's cool if you if you don't and i'll wrap with this but i mean if you don't know this my favorite fact about julie is that he was not only ray bradbury's first agent uh he was uh hp lovecraft's last agent well that's why and it's uh good that we end with this uh, schwartz question because of his involvement in science fiction yeah. prior to being involved oh in good turn good there you call go, back. yeah yeah oh so, you know there you go and exactly and i you know and forgive me i don't know if julia's covered yeah he's yeah his name check in the book is his mort weisinger because again they oh. were the science ears right they were the very they were along with her you know uh for sackerman at the nexus of what people don't understand is that when when science fiction became a genre in the pulps i mean it wasn't ever you know that was which was the garbage magazines of the day. And then Absolutely. people look down at pulp magazines. And, you know, we think of science fiction today as a legitimate genre, but it so was not back in those days. It was just considered by, you know, literate people to be complete garbage. And Julie, Moore Weisinger, Forty Ackerman, yeah. and a few others, they bonded together and they created science fiction fandom. Yes. Absolutely, man. No, and that's very cool. Well, again, it, and Mark, forgive me. Wh is this the cover, or is that this is the not cover? the cover? That's the cover right there. Okay, there you go. Because you, yeah, you, you were kind of sending me the PDF, yeah. and I love that shot of the astronauts. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is that wonderful cover then to look for at your local comic shop or to order online uh, through Amazon and the like. Yeah. The history of science fiction, humanoids uh, put it out, and it is a very comprehensive look truly at the history of science fiction and done in a very entertaining way with beautiful art. Once again, we'll, we'll show these pictures and, uh, and yeah, man, uh, coming up in just a couple months, it's going to be world's finest. That's right. And uh, Mark's return to Superman and we'll get his uh, take on him and Batman in a very timeless way. And uh, looking forward to all of that. Uh, if you would just stick around for one second as we wrap up, because I want to ask you something off the air and we'll, uh, we'll see if you're you interested in, in getting involved. Mark Wade, everybody. Uh, it's going to be a fun week. Hi, happy holidays. If, uh, happy holidays, you. everyone. We see you, and happy holidays, Mark, to you, and all the best. And uh, thank you for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll see you on the next Word Balloon Live.